this was a pretty controversial type of investment, much more so than what it is today. It's it's become mainstream. But, you know, critics back in the early days, there were some pretty loud critics of ETFs. You had Vanguard's founder, John Bogle, who was one of the biggest critics at the time. Thanks for listening to IBKR's Sense of Security. As always, there's more content at ibkrpodcast.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education content such as webinars, market commentary, market-related courses, and quant-related articles at ibkrcampus.com. Welcome back to the Sense of Security podcast. I'm Cassidy Clement, Senior Manager of SEO and Content at Interactive Brokers. Today, I'm your host for our podcast, and our guest is Ron DeLegge, the founder of ETF Guide. We're going to talk about the basics of ETFs. This investment product is structured a little bit differently compared to others in the space, and from its first days in the market to present day, one can see that the ETF's industry impact and the investor curiosity of the product has been seen. So welcome to the program, Ron. Cassidy, it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Of course. So how about you give our listeners a little bit of uh, your background in the industry? Well, I started in the mid-90s in the financial services industry as a stockbroker. That's what we were called back in the day, and I had a Series 7 license, and I did that for a while, um, about 11 years. I had my own RAA practice, and then I decided to focus more of my efforts on education surrounding ETFs. So around that time, I had launched uh, ETF Guide. This was in the early 2000s, just sort of as a blog. And uh, since then, we've we've added original programming uh, to our lineup, as well as tools for investors. And um, I'm also certified retirement counselor. Uh, that's part of the International Foundation of Retirement Education. So I do know a little bit about retirement planning and some of the things, you know, facing our generation of of investors. So that's sort of my background in the nutshell. Great. Well, it sounds like you'll be the right person to ask some of these questions to. So for people who are just getting exposed to um, investing, what exactly is an ETF and how is it structured compared to the other financial products that most people are familiar with, meaning the standard issue stocks and bonds? Yeah. So ETF, I, I remember back in the day, this always used to get confused with EFT, electronic funds transfer. (laughs) People would swap those words. But now ETF has become quite common and and better known uh, among the investing public. And it's actually an acronym for the the word exchange traded fund. Uh, And ETFs are usually diversified investments that will own a basket of securities like stocks or bonds. But today, many ETFs are actually undiversified and concentrated because they'll own a single asset, for example, like oil futures contracts or perhaps Bitcoin futures contracts. And now we've got a new generation of ETFs that may even old, own uh, individual stocks like Apple or NVIDIA. So ETFs uh, are quite diverse in what they offer as far as market exposure, but uh, they're definitely opening up a lot of opportunities for everyday investors. So they can be comprised of different types of other products, but it's kind of, I guess, like you said, it's like a basket that's diversified of some other things that would be in a normal portfolio or a pool of investments that everyone can get access to from investing in that one ETF instead of putting it together themselves. Is that correct? Yeah. So you've got a couple of different ways you can swing it. Um, Some ETFs will actually own other ETFs, like a fund-to-fund approach. Um, and that's sort of like an all-in-one solution for investors that maybe want to have a pre-built portfolio. And then you even have what's called target date ETF portfolios that uh, you know are designed to help you with a certain retirement target date. But then, like I was saying, you also have other ETFs, which are a little bit more concentrated in nature, a little bit more focused. You've got Sector ETFs, for example, that only invest in specific industry groups like technology stocks or uh, telecom or utilities. So there's a lot of choices and a lot of things to think about, um, you know, for the investor. Um, Sometimes I think, you know, when I look at the ETF industry compared to how it first started, there's so many choices, Cassidy. Sometimes I get choice anxiety, you know, it could be really overwhelming. So um, but again, 
you know, it's good that investors are listening to this podcast and, and gaining that knowledge and education before they dive in. So where exactly or when exactly did the ETFs kind of come into the market spotlight? Like what is their origin? Because as long as I've been exposed to the to financial trading and markets, I've always heard of them. And I also have had the confusion of EFT and ETF, but I've always been familiar with them. So when exactly did they hit the scene and how did it go? Yeah. So actually ETFs first debuted in 1990 in Canada. And uh, it's interesting, Canada, boy, they, they you got to hand Canada some props because they not only came up with the first ETF – but they also came up with the first Bitcoin, spot Bitcoin ETF, which was launched in, I believe it was 2021. But 1990 was the official launch date of ETFs as it's known. Shortly thereafter, in 1993, the Spider ETFs, which are linked to the S&P 500 equity index, debuted in here in the U.S. And that became the very first U.S. listed ETF. Now, in the early days... The ETF investing was mostly limited to large institutions and money managers and sophisticated, you know, pension, big pension funds, multi-billion dollar pension funds. But over time, what we've seen is the ETF industry and de investor base and demographics have really changed and it's greatly expanded and now includes RAAs, wealth advisors and even self-directed retail investors. So with all of those pieces of people getting in from, let's say, all angles, um, we're talking, like you said, retail investors. It's not just the money managers. It's not just the institutions. What type of impact was this having on the finance industry when it first entered and how it is now? Because it seems like it's another product for, of course, diversification, but it's also to help with uh, managing your risk, um, having something a little bit more passive than you managing it all the time yourself or having to pay someone to manage it at all times. Like how exactly did it impact the industry? Well, it's given the industry more uh, opportunities to offer their asset management services in another product format. This year, the big trend in 2023 has been mutual fund companies either converting you know, existing mutual fund sh share class to an ETF structure or even launching clo cloned cloned ETFs, which basically mimic existing, you know, strategies. So we're seeing a lot of active managers getting into the business, uh, offering active ETF solutions. So it's definitely, I think the industry itself, the asset management industry has had a lot more opportunities to, to appeal to a new demographic of investors. Um, I think about the early days of ETFs and, and getting back to, to when ETFs were still making a name for themselves. I mean, there, this was a pretty controversial type of investment, much more so than what it is today. It's it's become mainstream. But, you know, critics back in the early days, there were some pretty loud critics of ETFs. You had Vanguard's founder, John Bogle, who was one of the biggest critics at the time. This was right as Vanguard – was about to launch its own ETF lineup. They had not yet gotten into the ETF business, and there was a lot of internal debate whether they would do that or whether they shouldn't. And so here you had the founder, John Bogle, a proponent of, of mutual funds and indexing. Um, his problem with ETFs, he claimed that, well, they're going to become day traders. You know, we're going to take all these long-term investors and they become day traders. And so what these critics didn't did not understand or see is that ETFs actually appeal to both short-term and long-term investors, and that unlike mutual funds, active ETF trading by one set of shareholders of the same fund would have no negative tax or cost implications on another set of shareholders of the same ETF. So, you know, even even today, um, when you think about it, uh, ETFs are just so unique because you can have shareholders of the exact same fund with opposite goals. You know, shareholder A might be using the ETF as a short-term vehicle, maybe a portfolio placeholder, whereas a, another shareholder might be using the same ETF for a completely different goal. And and this is this is something that's radically changed just the mindset of the finance industry because historically shareholders flock to a fund because they have the same goal. With ETFs it's not necessarily the case. So that's that's just 
due to the unique structure of the ETF itself. It's greatly improved the way investors allocate money. Um, I think because, like I said, just from this example, one shareholder, whatever they do, if they want to trade daily, that's fine. But whatever they do is never going to impact another shareholder. And I think that's a beautiful thing that's unique to the ETF structure. And it's really, you know, a truly fair and democratic approach as opposed to, you know, me holding a fund and then my activity impacting you know, shareholders that remain. One final thing, uh, sorry for the long-winded answer here too, Cassidy. Um, the other thing I will say that ETFs have done, getting back to your question about how has this impacted the fi finance industry, is they've really opened up and broken through the asset class universe. They've made it easy for investors to obtain market exposure to nearly every asset class you can think of with, with a very low degree of, of cost and, and also they've they've overcome these obstacles of difficulty. Uh, for example, you know, investors don't need to own a farm or a futures brokerage uh, account to get exposure to commodities. They can just use commodity ETFs to get their exposure. And there's many other examples. We see cryptocurrencies are just beginning to you know open up again. The ETF structure allows investors to keep that that brokerage account. They can. If that ETF follows that certain asset class, they can get that exposure with that ETF. So, again, these are just examples of ETFs breaking up, breaking open brand new asset classes and allowing investors to, to you know, gain diversified exposure, which is a good thing. So I'm just asking this from the perspective of uh, somebody just taking a look at some investment products. But if you were to explain, at least just briefly, um, the difference between what a mutual fund is and a ETF, just so listeners don't have any overlap, because I know when I was studying for the Series 7 that, um, you know, sometimes it's hard because a lot some ETPs are similar to mutual funds and some of them, well, you do have pooled investments, but some have the buy and sell feature throughout the day. If you could just give a little um, explanation so we don't confuse the listeners. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, the main difference here, we don't want to overcomplicate things. Right. You know, mutual funds and ETFs are cousins. They're both related to each other. So they're they're similar in nature in many aspects. I mean, the main difference is obviously a mutual fund only trades once a day and you're going to buy it or sell it at its net asset value, value, also known as NAV. Whereas an ETF, it trades throughout the day. So as long as the market's open for business, you're going to see an ETF uh, have trading volume. You can buy it and sell it just like an individual stock. Right. And um, that's what we call intraday liquidity. That's the fancy, fancy language. And that's the, really the main difference is that intraday liquidity that you get with ETFs. You don't have intraday liquidity with mutual funds. You have to wait till the end of the day. And you don't really know what the price is going to be. So you, you lose some flexibility, I think, with, when it comes to – you know, determining when you're going to buy and, you know, what price you're going to buy at and what price you're going to sell at. I think that's a big disadvantage uh, for the mutual fund shareholder that doesn't really get discussed a lot. But again, you know, I like to buy personally, you know, when I go into a store, I like to know what the price tag is before I buy it. Um, and so I think investors, you know, should just keep that in mind. But, you know, ETFs and mutual funds overlap in many different asset classes and you even have, you know, some firms will offer a mutual fund and an ETF for the same exact uh, index or asset class. And they do that, again, just for convenience, because some investors may um, still be using a mutual fund in their investments. Like, for example, if it's a, a 401k retirement plan or something of that nature, there may not be, may not be an ETF choice. So um, but I think, you know, looking ahead, it's my hope. And I'm really a big proponent of ETFs inside retirement plans. I think that's the one place where the ETF industry is still missing in a big way uh, is is not really, you know, they haven't really been players in the 401k marketplace. But I think that's going to change in the future. I think you're going to start seeing ETFs right alongside mutual funds in 401k plans, 403b plan. It's going to become more commonplace as the ETF industry matures. Let's not forget, too, Cassidy, the mutual fund industry is going to be 100 years old next year. 
So the first mutual fund was launched in 1924. Um, and so ETFs, think about that. ETFs just celebrated their 30-year anniversary earlier this year. So you've got a an ETF product that's only 30 years old versus a mutual fund product, which is, you know, 100. So, you know, that's a big difference in terms of age. So obviously, you know, mutual funds are a lot more mature. ETFs are still catching up, but we've seen tremendous asset growth. The ETF industry is around $7 trillion. So they've grown in such a uh, very fast in such a short time. And um, eventually, some are predicting that ETF assets will eventually uh, surpass mutual funds. So, And I think that will happen only if ETFs become more commonplace in 401k retirement plans. But uh, that's something that is to be determined. And maybe maybe a good topic for a future conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that in and of itself could be its own podcast, probably. But you actually had mentioned something I totally forgot about. I had like a flashback to my finance 101 uh, exam when I heard intraday versus interday. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Remembering and keeping those things separate. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I, I totally... Uh, for those of you out there who are studying for your finance exam with ETFs versus mutual funds, I sympathize with you. Uh, make the bullet lists for them to remind yourself the dif of the differences because it sometimes gets to be hard to keep up. Um, but for the investors entering the ETF space who are just starting out and there's a lot of things to synthesize and, of course, as Everybody knows who does their own investment research. There are so many research points out there. So what are some things that investors should look for when starting to scope out a new investment opportunity in the ETF space? Well, I think before you even start looking at ETFs, investors first need to understand what are my goals? What am I after? What am I trying to achieve? And, and that gets back to something called a written document that's called an investment policy statement. And it sounds a lot more fancier than it, it really is. It just explains what you as an investor, what your goal is. What, what is your, going to be your target asset asset mix? What is your time horizon for investing? What are the types of investments that you're going to use to reach your goals? What are the types of investments you're going to avoid? And um, if you're working with a financial advisor or RIA, you know, what are the, the, the fees? You know, what's what, what are the fees that you're going to be paying to them? Um and you can also set limits like I won't pay more than X amount, you know, so investors have a lot of choices to make. But I think it really begins before you even start talking about ETFs or anything for that matter. It begins with having a solid understanding of, um, you know, what your goals are. So that's the investment policy statement. And all investors should have that. You know, if you're working with an advisor, most advisors, you know, will, will supply you with that. But even if you're a self-directed investor making your own choices, you should still have something that's written that dictates what your portfolio will be. And then after you've done that, then you can get into what your framework for building an investment portfolio is. I think about it like architecture of a building. Like before you start building that that structure, you got to have an understanding of what what is the blueprint, right? What are the materials that are going to be used? How many stories is that that building going to be? Um, and you know, the the basics of what the architecture is going to be. So for right. a portfolio, you know, an investor using ETFs, you want to start there and then build out that portfolio. Usually, you start with something called a core. So a core is usually broadly diversified funds that give you you know, asset class exposure to the core asset classes like stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate. Those are the big four. And then cash. And, um, you know, once you build out the core, that's your foundation. Then you can add, you know, other elements, what what what, what are known as a supplementary or, or pieces of that portfolio that kind of uh, accentuate your core and maybe allow you to personalize your portfolio a little bit more. Maybe you want to emphasize you know, certain themes, whether that be, you know, um, a certain movement or trend in, in, in the business world, you can, you know, find ETFs for that. So, again, start with a good core. Also, I encourage investors to always have a what I call a margin of safety or a cushion to make sure that you're able to have that safety, liquidity, and also principal protection. I think that's a, a real core and important part of a portfolio. So, 
again, these are all things that, uh, you know, think about even before you buy your first ETF is just to have uh, an understanding of, of what the goal is and how you're going to build this portfolio. You're, it, you're really the architect of a, of a building. It's your financial house. So you, you need to have some, some thought before you start, you know, buying the bits and pieces of, of that of that house. Yeah. I mean, I always thought of ETFs. I know they call it a basket of securities, but I always kind of thought of it like that. Like you're going through the supermarket, which then I guess is a direct metaphor for the stock market and you're putting items into the basket and you want to make sure that you understand how well the item is going to perform. What's it made of? How much is it going to cost you both now and later if you have to sell it? Things like that. And understanding if you're going for something trendy, trends, aren't always permanent. So like you said, making sure you understand you may need a cushion or something like that if your investment isn't perfect, which no investments are. Um, but what are some well-known ETFs or important ETFs that uh, listeners may be familiar with that they've heard in the space of financial media and journalism? Yeah, I mean, the big ones that you hear about on a daily basis are like the triple Qs. I mean, the, the ETFs that dominate trading volume are the ones that get the most attention. You know, triple Qs are an example, which are linked to the Nasdaq 100. The Spider uh, S&P 500 ETF, which we discussed earlier, that was the first ETF ever launched here in the U.S. Just celebrated its 30-year anniversary. Um, so these these are some well-known, you know, ETFs. The one thing I will say is just because it's well-known or heavily traded does not necessarily mean it's right for you. So um, there's a lot of you know ETFs that are actually um, more obscure in nature that that are actually quite good that you know again investors can use a platform like interactive brokers to you know look at some of the research that's available out there and do some digging do some digging and and find those gems because there's some real good gems out there that that may uh, you know help you to accentuate your portfolio embellish it get it to where you want you know, your portfolio, it constantly, things are constantly changing. You alluded to it, you know, about trends. Things are constantly changing. And so just because you build a portfolio doesn't mean you're done. There's always tweaks. There's always rebalancing. There's always adjustments that need to be made. It's just, you know, I mean, we can use another analogy. I'm not much of a sail sailor personally, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do I do paddleboard. And so when I go out there, and I go on the on the ocean and um, you know paddleboard. Conditions are constantly like fluctuating. You know the ocean is never, you know, just flat. And you know some some days are just flat and it's like ice skate. It's like beautiful, but then other days it could be choppy. So you have to constantly adjust, and and you know conditions in the market change very quickly. So I think investors need to be ready and and flexible and be adapting. Yeah, I mean. Thinking about um, investment when you talk to people who maybe do it for a living or um, have been doing it for a long time, most will say it's not a set it and forget it game. You have yeah. to adjust, you have to be aware, and you have to be ready to, um, you know, potentially have a reaction if if some one of your uh, investments is against the trend or with the trend. You never know. True. One one thing I will say, if I can just add. I think it doesn't get discussed very much, but I, I see this with some of the portfolios that uh, that I've seen from ETF investors. There's a tendency to over diversify. In other words, investors will sometimes own too much of the same thing. So ETFs with a different ticker symbol, but if you look at the underlying holdings, they're almost identical. You know, they own you know the, the the usual suspects. You know, Apple, Amazon. Google, you know, and even though it's a different ticker symbol and it looks different on your portfolio screen, you know, or your or your statement, actually you may own a lot of the same thing. And that's something called over diversification, which is is like, you know, diluting your soup. You know, no one wants to eat diluted soup. You know, you want soup that has good flavor to it. It's it's not overwhelming, but it's it hits the right spot. And so I think with your investments, you want to think about it from that perspective. You don't want to over diversify and dilute your efforts um, or even increase your, your risk unbeknownst to you. If you own too much of the same stuff and that same stuff is sinking, 
you know, owning more of it is not going to help you. Right. Diversifying to diversify what you diversified with can sometimes come back around. <laughs> so Correct. it can all be cyclical or you end up with the same thing. So when one domino falls, the rest of them do. Yeah, there, there's a chance you can confuse yourself. But um, you brought up some really great points about um, ways to get into the ETF space, what they're all about and kind of those initial questions that somebody might have as they start to investigate. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Cassidy, it was fun. Thank you for having me, and I hope we catch up again. Of course. So as always, listeners can learn more about an array of financial topics for free at ibkrcampus.com. Follow us on your favorite podcast network, and feel free to leave us a review or a rating. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to IBKR's Sense of Security. As always, there's more content at ibkrpodcast.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education content such as webinars, market commentary, market-related courses, and quant-related articles at ibkrcampus.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. This material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice. Any discussion or mention of an ETF is not to be construed as recommendation, promotion, or solicitation. All investors should review and consider associated investment risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company or fund prior to investing. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice. Trading in digital assets, including cryptocurrencies, is especially risky and is only for individuals with a high risk tolerance and the financial ability to sustain losses. Eligibility to trade in digital asset products may vary based on jurisdiction. Futures are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ibkr.com. Mutual funds are investments that pool the funds of investors to purchase a range of securities to meet specified objectives such as growth, income, or both. Investors are reminded to consider the various objectives, fees, and other risks associated with investing in mutual funds. IBKR does not solicit you to invest in specific funds and does not recommend specific funds or any other products to you. For additional information, please view our mutual fund product listings.